I so I took my two year old son to that. <laughs> <laughs> he had he been to a movie yet? He had seen the Super Mario Bros. movie, okay. and he sat like had he this done acid yet the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Kite Club Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Kite. With me, as always, is my best friend. Mr. Seth Shapiro. What's going on, everybody? Hey. We've got uh, Ben in the booth and a very special guest that I'm going to introduce in just one second. Real uh, real fast, uh, real fast, uh, viv, quick, fast, <laughs> fast, <laughs> uh, we're playing backwards. You can uh, hear Satan's lyrics. Uh, rules of Kite Club. First rule of Kite Club is like and subscribe and tell everyone about Kite Club. That's just all three rules. Just get them out. We don't have time for three. We're excited about the guest today. I'm going to be in Tempe, Arizona this weekend, June 29th through July 2nd. Uh, come get those tickets, baby. I'm going to be there. They're at jonathankaikcomedy.com and for all the fun dates and info. We have a very special guest in-house today. You know him from his specials on YouTube. You've probably seen him live. This guy is everywhere, all over the place. Give it up for my man, Mr. Jeremiah Watkins. Hey, what's going on, guys? How are you? Dude, so happy to have you, man. Yeah, Good man. to be here in the flesh. Man, I love your shirt, bro. Oh, thanks, man. A little fast eddies. It's a... Uh pool hall in uh, San Antonio I played at. That's are you good at pool? Uh for a comedian I'm good at pool. Does that make sense? Yes it does. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. for commercial casting, Jeremiah has said he can do a commercial. Oh no. To play pool. Dude, in my sleep I could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know it's funny because we went to a pool hall in the valley one time where there was a guy who had the old bozo, you know, hair around the ring and nothing on top. They call that the power bowl. Yeah, yeah. That was that was his uh, also his pool name. Yeah, and he sat there with the highest. I mean, I'm talking about tits up Wranglers. He had the the the, the shirt that sort of muffin topped all over the place. Uh -huh. Big dude, a, a striper, uh, long sleeve, the pinky ring, the gold watch, the glasses, the uh, the shop teacher stash, and he was just sitting there. And I remember he was playing a friend of ours, uh -huh. and you went to the bathroom and to pee. And by the time you came back, he had already beaten our friend. Yeah. Oh, clean like, the table. Just, just like yeah, dude yeah. was was there to make rent. Uh huh. You know, I once I once beat a guy like that one time at Barney's Beanery who was like cleaning everyone out just like that. And I put my little quarter up. I'm like, I guess I'll take a shot. And uh, you know, he, and so finally it was my turn. He broke. I didn't get a shot off the whole game. And on the last shot of the game, he did the craziest uh, trick, like off you know three rails, and then hit the eight ball. And on the way in. It just barely grazed one of my balls, and so went on the table. Yeah, and uh, the eight ball went in, and so officially it was a scratch, and I won. I was there for that game without ever taking a shot. I felt so bad. I was like, because like the guy probably had been playing like two straight hours, and I was like, dude, you don't have to lose the table to me for that stuff. He's like, no, no, man, it's uh, no, it's official. I mean, those, those official rules. I'm like, uh, he okay. just laughed. All you heard was a gunshot. Yeah, yeah. he goes to his car. Yeah, 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 I'll be right back. <laughs> he unscrews this and then screws together a gun. Yeah. I'll be right his back. Off. The do, final shot. Do you have your? Uh, do you have a a, a pool a pool cue of your own? Do you have a pool cue? Do you have, your pool cue I have a couple of pool cues. Uh, I play Finnish uh, rules. Uh, yes, Finnish rules. It's a little different than what's going on over here in the states. We yeah. play a little different. A little different. Little little faster over there. The, the, the healthcare is better. Yes, actually. Uh, my my father in law gave me a, a cool cue um, that he used to play with, and then uh, I've got like one that my dad uh, gave me for like a Christmas present years ago. Um, but I, I usually, honestly, will just play with whatever the house cues are. I prefer that than like taking a cue because also that's a red flag. By the way, you coming in with your own cue, people are like, "This guy's yeah. a." Uh, it's hard yeah. To get. Also, da -da 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 -da. especially if you yeah. suck that day Bro. too, because I don't play consistently enough. Where like I'll have flashes of like where people get impressed, but then you know you have off days, and then you're like, uh, I don't play consistently enough to get like really good. If you suck, everyone's gonna assume that you're just trying to hustle them. Yeah. Right. And you're like, no, no, I really do suck about 40% of the time. They're like, yeah, sure. All right. I played with, yeah. uh, I was at the um, the Addison Improv uh, in Texas uh, one weekend, and I went uh, to play at a bar with some of the staff afterwards. And I had never done this before. And they thought that I was trying to hustle them. But even though we weren't playing for money, like yeah. I, I started breaking and I cleaned the table on like the first game. Wow. And yeah. he's like, I didn't even get a shot off. I'm like, I promise you, I that that's the first time I've ever done that. Yeah, right. Please <laughs> tell me we were recording. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah that's uh, that's one of those ones where you sort of you can hear someone break. 
Mm-hmm. And then you go, oh, that whoever that did that is going to be trouble. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can hear that. <laughs> yeah. Just, I, I, I'm at the point where where when I get a good break off, that to me is just like a relief where I'm like, all right, at least I didn't like botch the break. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. then the rest of the game you're like, oh, man. But also they think they can take you. So I try to whiff the break. <laughs> and then I whiff the game. And then I go home and whiff by myself. <laughs> right. um, but you know the funny thing is uh, with, with your, your shirt is um, – so The Hustler is one of my favorite movies of all time. Same here. I love, love it. it. And it's amazing because you, you tell people about The Hustler. They're like, man, if you like that, you're going to love Color of Money. And I'm like, <laughs> it's the sequel to The Hustler. But I mean, Color of Money is amazing, too. Uh, Tom Cruise is yeah. so damn good. You, you but- know that that movie did like a lot for the pool industry. Yeah. It like made pool cool again in the 80s, like around that when that came out. Like uh-huh. They, they play nine after, ball. Yeah. They said when that movie dropped... <laughs> It was similar to uh, like when Queen's Gambit came out during the mm-hmm. pandemic yeah. on Netflix. The chess boards flew off the shelves and you couldn't find them on anywhere, even though it was sold out everywhere online. Mm-hmm. And the, all the distributors were like, we don't have enough to supply. And yeah. that's how it was with the pool halls like after uh, that came out. Like uh, like what Rounders was for poker in the late Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 100%. Yeah, sure. and people go, oh, this is cool. but Because it, The Hustler, I believe it was written by a guy who got blacklisted because of communism. And mm-hmm. so that was like the last thing he ever did. Wow. And it was amazing that Martin Scorsese was like, I'll do a sequel to this, like, you know, 30 years later or something. Yeah. It's, yeah. Especially someone like Martin Scorsese. Yeah. 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 Was like, it was like, why would you do a sequel to, so, like, you're an established director, you're doing so, a sequel to somebody else's film. Like, it's crazy. It did it. You know what's interesting, though, is Paul Newman, who plays Fast Eddie. Mm-hmm. So, him and Jackie Gleason, if you haven't seen the original, plays Minnesota Fats. And Jackie Gleason was a good enough pool player where all of the shots in the movie that he. He performs them himself. His face is in all of those shots, which yeah. is so impressive. It's crazy to, to think back of, of the type of stuff. It's like doing your own is. stunts. It dude. really is. So so that's why perfect for Tom Cruise being in it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and dude, he he got good. He I'm did. Uh, yeah. He's method. I do my own stunts. You know. <laughs> Crack. Uh, <laughs> yeah. He's running around the yeah, table yeah, yeah, to yeah, get yeah, to the exactly. ball. I'm gonna get that ball. <laughs> that's also what he says at Scientology meetings. Um, it's a it's a it's a cool movie, and the fact that it was able to they were able to be consistent with the character because Paul Newman really feels like the same character. Oh yeah, so, I mean that's just incredibly impressive, and the idea that and he that's what he won his Academy Award for was Color of Money. Okay, out of all cool. the things that that guy did, I know so many movies. Yeah. That is crazy, but he's really good in that movie. Yeah. Really good. He's really good, yeah. and I, I like uh, Paul Newman dressing good. Oh that's my how good yeah. He is in that movie. That that's what he's known. Yeah, that's what he's known for. His, yeah. his, his honorary Academy Award was a condiment. Yeah, he, he's at every craft service. Table. There's a bottle of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, What's the last line of that movie? It's something like he makes an amazing shot and he goes, "I'm back." I'm back. Or I'm something. Back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I could fill a bottle with my cum, and then just like shows the dressing. <laughs> and they're like, "Let's go take it again." Hey, hey. Th- that last take was a little weird. Paul. Hey, Paul, we like what you did there. Come here a second take. Yeah. Who, who told him he could improvise? It's Ooh, the last you, line. You're going to love my nut. Tastes like Thousand Island. Okay, cut. <laughs> we are going to use that one, though. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's cool, though. That's uh, I'll have to check it out. I just I in a, I was like, oh, maybe you love the movie, but I was like, are you a Spurs when fan? They, when there's a... No, that's... Just, yeah, uh, when there's a pool hall and they have any kind of t-shirt merch that looks remotely cool, I'll get it in the city that I'm in because for whatever reason... Pool is synonymous with like crossbones and skulls and random like flames and stuff, and they always look. Yeah, really because of weird. venom. Do you ever see those the, or Black Widow, the trick shot people on YouTube? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they look like anime characters, right? Well, but it also has a very like like um, kind of bar, kind of like motorcycle, like a writer, yeah, 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 yeah culture. Yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. I always I I'm like that with like um, vintage video games, like and like there was a uh, there was a bar that we performed Kung Fu. at, yeah, the Kung Fu Saloon, Saloon yeah. in Nashville, which was a barcade. And then all the the shirts that they had there had Kung Fu Saloon um, imprinted on like the background of like different arcade games. So yeah, I grabbed one with Donkey Kong. On yeah, it was, it was cool. awesome. Yeah. You know the, the interesting thing about uh, Pool is like, do you remember when Pool Hall Junkies came out? Mm-hmm. Dude, I love that movie. I yeah. see. I didn't see it when it first came out. I was recommended the movie, uh, and then I watched it later. So. We saw it in the theaters. 
okay. together. And it was funny because I had to buy it on VHS by the time that I like it was it was more like I watched it like six years ago or something like that for the first time. Oh. So I had to buy it on Hold VHS, on. couldn't find it anywhere. Humble brag. Yep. You have a VCR? Oh yeah. Dude, I love that about you. Oh yeah. That's awesome. I I still have, hooked up and everything, ready dude. to go. Hey, yo, ready to hey. go, just in case. I have Michael Jackson's Moonwalker original. Nice. I have a bunch of VHSs that I just collected. And not that I think they'd be worth something, but just cool to have them. Yeah. And um, there's stuff that, that didn't come out in other formats. So the fact that you were able to get that's so cool. Yeah, I couldn't find it to rent online anywhere. And I used to play, when I used to go back on the road uh, with uh, Tony Hinchcliffe a lot, He we played like for hours and hours. That's what we would do after our shows. He's like, you haven't seen Pool Hall Junkies? He's like, it's one of the best pool movies. You got to get it. And I was like, okay. And then I tried to find it. I'm like, I can't find it. And I, I found a VHS copy on like eBay or something like that. Walking is so good. Oh, in that movie yes. when he gives the speech in the bathroom mm-hmm. it's like the king of the jungle the lions <laughs> <laughs> like it was just like who there's nobody him or Chaz Palminteri that's all who could have played that part mm-hmm. and it, yeah he is so good I mean it's and it, it was it was exciting I feel like I started playing more pool because of that movie mm-hmm. but yeah I mean those those not um, you lost a lot of money that year after uh, brother that movie came out I'm doing this this podcast. Uh, yeah. the, the worst they thing garnish ever... my wages. The pool community garnishes wages from this podcast. That movie is the worst thing that ever happened to you, dude. It is. I am. You never hear that about. It's like you're in for um, uh, addicts anonymous. You know, yeah. like mm-hmm. you never hear people just in there as pool hall junkies. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like sitting in there, just like oh, I can still feel it. Just bringing in their cue, oh, just playing around. <laughs> so, have you ever gone down a pool highlights like wormhole, like on any of like TikTok or Instagram, yes. like Efren and all that stuff? It's so Efren entertaining. Oh, mm-hmm. But that's where Venom and the Black Widow are. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Use, so, for those of you who don't know, those um, Venom and Black Widow are amongst. There's a ton of them that can do these incredible shots that take the amount of skill that it takes, the understanding and physics. Every time in the setup, I mean, I, who knows? It doesn't matter how many attempts it takes. The fact that they can do it cleanly, mm-hmm. consistently, and replicate be, it, and replicate it, and, yeah. and, and and people then mimic them. It's it's sort of like how people look at Allen Iverson or somebody do a, a move in basketball or like and one or like you see someone do an impression. They're like, oh, that's the handle, that's the angle, that that's how they're getting into it or whatever. But the fact that they can have the the muscle and the skill to create it is such a deep understanding. I think mm-hmm. of pool. That, I had a buddy who was like who taught me a lot, who was like an amateur pool player, like in tournaments and stuff like that. And he started to teach me to train my eye differently, to look at the table where uh, where he's like, what do you think the right shot is? And I'd be like, oh, it's this one. He goes, nope, guess again. I'm like, okay, this one. And he's like, nope. He goes, you need to kick it off this into there. I'm like, I I couldn't wrap around my head around. And then I started seeing literally the table differently. And then I'm like, oh, this is how like, like people are getting around all these balls and stuff is because they're starting to see the angles in front of them. Yeah, it's it's chess. It you're like, essentially it really playing, is. You're playing the move beyond the move. That was like always, the most basic yeah. BS that somebody taught me one time, where they were like, "You have to do this one because it's going to put always, you into yeah, exactly yeah. that." It's it's a it's a chain of events. It has nothing to do with the shot you're mm-hmm. doing. It's about the one you're about to set up or the yep. second to third one you're going to set up. Yeah. So when you see people are able to do that within a trick. Mm-hmm sort of environment they're setting up the 10th shot in the first the mm-hmm. only time they ever move the queue yeah mm-hmm. it's it's unreal so people um i mean you're you're everywhere i mean i as long as i've been doing comedy you have been a staple in the la comedy world and do you think i mean forever when they were doing it in la and obviously i've seen you a ton on the on, on youtube when they go to austin but y- you were a fixture in kill tony yeah for I mean, as long as I can remember. Yeah, yeah. How did you get involved with that? So Tony and I were just buddies, uh, and it was something where I did one of the I like was one of the the early panel guests when he did the show on the road in La Jolla. It was like me and Earl Skake on the panel. I think it like within the first I wanna say ten to fifteen episodes. Oh wow. Where like he had me on as a panel guest and like I was like I'm always like pretty good in the in the panel setting i think it's a very specific skill set that you develop and i've gotten way better at it over the years but uh he had um something called the iron patriot uh he used to have this guy who would come in uh that he met i believe is a hollywood street performer that he had met and he's like i want to be a part of the show i forget exactly how that happened but he was like well i'll let you be head of security so he would stand at the corner of the stage in a full movie quality Iron Patriot suit, 
and he would talk with Tony occasionally. They would put a mic up to his chest because that's where it came out of. He did, like it was very very weird and very funky and very kind of alt uh, at the at, at the beginning uh, how it started. So after that guy, he went a little crazy and he got banned from doing the show because he was a Hollywood street performer. Yeah. And he wasn't like all there. Uh, Tony started having guest Iron Patriots. So like Tiffany Haddish and all these comics like like Ryan Mervis, all these different people at the comedy store would fill in as Iron Patriots. So I did that one night and <laughs> I did, cool. did it a couple times and like I was better in that format as like more of a character dressed up than like just on the panel. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, later on, uh, Pat Reagan, he would do the musical openings for the show for the first like uh, year or so of the show uh, to warm up the crowd before they started recording. And Pat and I, we had started doing like uh, music comedy duo stuff a while uh, f- for there for a while called Reagan Watkins and he's like hey can I invite Jeremiah on to like sit with me as part of the band um, because they started having Pat as the band and then then I started chiming in like as part of the band and then Pat and I came up with this idea to start committing to different characters like every week and not letting them know what it was yeah that's cool so it was a surprise to them First, it started off as intro. Like, we walked up to Prince, Little Red Corvette, and we had, like, purple, like, you know, bouffants and all this stuff. But then we started committing fully to the characters, and Tony's like, I think you guys are on to something because, like, when you're dialed in, like, at, when you're committing those characters, it's a different vibe for the show altogether rather than you, like, popping in and out as yourself. And so we started doing that, like, every week with Joel Jimenez. And so me, Pat, and Joel, like, had a big kind of part in, like, figuring out what the costumes were going to be, what characters we were going to be every week. And then um, later on it became Joel and I and uh, Chroma Chris. And then like at towards uh, the end of the L.A. run, uh, Jesse Johnson was part of it. And, yeah, we just did like these crazy characters and impressions every single week. And it was kind of like our own sketch show, our own improvised sketch show. Yeah, that's it, what it, it was. It was like a like. show within a show, basically. Yeah, because people, if you don't know the format for Kill Tony – it's essentially it's Tony Hinchcliffe um, with other uh, with a panel uh, sort of at a, and they invite they pull names out of a hat and then people come up and they do their best minute of stand up. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, I mean, you can watch full episodes on YouTube. It's very entertaining. Now, some people are good, but there's a lot of dead air. And so you really do need it's not just enough to have them because then they talk to the panel and Tony afterwards, which can be entertaining. But I always felt like having you guys there was a safety net. Because you were so entertaining and different in whatever was going on that the ball never felt like it dropped. And when you do it live. Yeah. yeah. Also, if we happen, let's say we throw out some lines and it kills. That's great for the show. Let's say we throw out some lines and it bombs. That's more for Tony and Red Band to riff off of. Exactly. Oh, God, uh, the band's at it again. And they know that you guys can riff back. Whereas, you know, I think that there's a skill set that you people get so used to looking at social media online that everybody's good at crowd work. They're not. That everybody's good in the moment. They're not. Yeah, you know how you can figure that out by watching those videos that everybody's posting right now, where they're just doing crowd work and it's terrible and dull. Yeah, they're like, who, who's, uh, who's everyone, here from out of town? And then it applauds, and then it's like, yeah. that's the clip. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and yeah. and it's like, it's true. Well, people don't want to burn material, but to really be good at that, um, and you guys are so good in the moment that it feels like, in a weird way, like a Saturday Night Live show where that person in that moment is the guest. Yeah, they're able to be as good as they can be. But whether or not they are, it won't. Um, it doesn't affect necessarily the quality of the show because you you guys are so good at keeping that ball in the right. air. Mm-hmm. So because the thing is, when when I watch your stuff, I mean, my favorite thing that you do is stand up on the spot. Oh, thanks, and man. that's such. A, if you haven't seen it, it's an it's a it really is like a, a, a put your money where your mouth is because I think that that there's an idea that. Um, and you get you get such incredible talent, and and you do it here, you do it in New York. I've seen you do it in Austin. Yeah, I've seen it in a, yeah, a yeah. bunch of different spots. The one thing that's consistent is you get the A list talent, which is great because I think that there's a what we were just talking about. There's an assumption that people are great at crowd work, or that they can just sort of like see your shirt and riff off of that. And the truth is, it go, what you see online is like edited together the best two seconds. Of like a thing that happened over it. So when when well, explain to the the people at home who are may not familiar with yeah, the show. So stand up on the spot is comedians going up with no prepared material, asking the audience for suggestions, and then riffing off the audience suggestions. So 
no materials allowed, and it's basically you set the pace of your set. You can take as many suggestions or as few as you want. Depending on the comment, uh, the comic who is up there, some comics, uh, like when we would have Joe Rogan on the show, he would take one topic and riff or rant for like 10 minutes yeah. because that's his style. For sure. He's so comfortable in that podcasting format that he would just hammer 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 out different ideas and then when he would you know he would he would hammer hammer and then when he started on to something to get a laugh then he'd go down that path and then all of a sudden he would be 15 minutes into a one suggestion he's like i don't even know where how we got this started what's the next suggestion yeah where other people are like suggestion da, 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 da. Okay, give me another suggestion. Like they're one-liner type comics, and so, I feel like that uh, reflects their crowd work because the, totally the, the, the what I just saw was the one you did in New York. So Mark Norman, who's really great at one-liners, uh, that he yeah. just he just kept asking for suggestions. Yeah, and he's so quick with them that he's just sort of like, yeah, there you go, there you go, and he and he's able hey, to do that. Hey, I'm gay. Act. I don't know. Queef. <laughs> That's all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he crushed it, but it, but it, but and people like that that to see he's, how he's, you're. So, he's um, there's a handful of people who I consider to be some of the best of the show he's definitely at the top of the list uh mark norman gets brought up as a, as a fan favorite a lot and then uh tony baker which uh, i try to turn on to as many people as possible who if they don't there's a lot of new york people who don't know who tony baker is tony baker check him out he is an in he's an unbelievable an insane comic. talent yeah. Yeah. insane yeah so relaxed i was watching him of his stand-up the other day he's just chilling yep there's like i mean He's so himself. He knows himself so well on stage where it's it's super cool to watch, especially seeing him in the moment do jokes that you're like, how is this not material? This yeah. is crazy good. Very impressive guy. And the cool thing about it is it's, it's one of those tough things where everybody's on your side. I always feel like the crowds, because it's become such a successful show that people know about, the crowds are really on the side of the comic because what they're doing is really hard, whether I, people know it or I not. I take that upon myself at the beginning of the show because I do an example set up top. I'm like, like we're, we're getting into this like, this is really hard. Yeah. Like this is really I, I tell people all the time, like who watch the show online, I'm like, this is literally the hardest show in comedy. Hundred mm -hmm. percent. The hardest. So set your expectations there. Like if anybody does remotely well on the show, that's a huge win. Because it's so easy to bomb on the show. Have you ever seen them um, stand up on the spot? It's a similar thing where they like put this suggestion behind you where it pulls out of the hat. Uh set list. Oh so, so there's Oh, sorry. I apologize. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's yours. Yeah, yeah. No, no. A set list. Absolutely. I apologize. We'll edit that part out. We won't. And um, <laughs> but but it there. I think when you see that, um, it didn't like yours. There's something about it. Number one, the a, not to say that that doesn't have it, but yours. Whenever I watch them, there's so much a list talent. Like the fact that they're getting a great show, no matter what. Oh yeah. And the fact what I love about yours. Um, as opposed to the other one, the, whose name I can't remember immediately. Uh, you, Troy Conrad and Paul Provenza, but, they run Setless. Yeah. But but yours, you come out. Yes. And you do it with them after they've done it. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that's really cool. That's for me when when the show started to become what it is now is, uh, is when I started. That's when it kind of came full circle because I used to just do a set up top and then just introduce the comics. And I did that for years. And then I'm like, well, why am I just like doing an example set and then there's not really any reason for me to be there the rest of the show? So when we started doing that, then it started to feel like, oh, this is why this guy's the host is like, he's, I mean, that's my skill set is I love riffing with other people. Like, yeah. that, that's the whole thing. Like, just being a, like any, a part of any ensemble cast of shows that I've been in LA over the years, I love working with people and off of people. And in stand up, you know, you're yeah. solo, so yeah. that's how I look at the crowd as kind of like my scene partner a lot. For that's, sure. That's exactly how, because like both of us have a, a very big improv past. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we started doing stand up, I think one reason why I hesitated to do it for a while is because I really loved that scene partner aspect of improv, right? It's like, yes, you've got someone to work with. And it took me a, a while when I was doing stand up to, to re realize that, to be like, no, I still have a scene partner here. It's just, mm -hmm. it is the audience instead yeah. of just the one on stage. And it's so funny because like, it seems like that there are like, you know, two communities out here. It's like you have the improv community, improv slash sketch community, and then you have the stand up community and they're both deathly afraid of 
of what it, of the art form of the other one. Like it, it's been my experience that like people who are improvers are definitely afraid of the notion of stand up of being like there is no forgiveness in the way that there is with improv be, be, from the audience because they know that this is material that you've had an infinite amount of time to work on. So there's no reason for it not to be funny. Um, and, it, and it's just you up there, you know, and then stand up. It's the opposite. A lot of comics who are like, how can you go up there with nothing? That's, that's crazy. To yeah. Me. How do you not know what you're going to say? Sure. You have someone else to work with, but like, how do you, how do you write and, and perform all at once? You know, it's, it's really funny, but then like, I mean, obviously, when we write, when we do material, I mean, I'm we're, we improvise material. That's how we come yeah, up with our material. I feel like that's right. It is one of the same. And that's why I feel like when it's like when you and the person get up there, when you join them, there's a riff that goes on. And it turns like that could really turn into bits. Sure. Yeah. Because it's like you guys are pitching like two friends getting together and being like, well, what about this? I'm trying to set them up a lot of times. Like 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 sometimes I'm, I start to kind of interview them a little bit to kind of like push them in the direction of something uh, that, that I hear where I'm like, I want to hear their point of view, but they might not get into this themselves. But me as a fan of them also, because like the people who I book, like I, I love them all as comics too. I'm like, if, this is like me as an audience member now getting to ask them some questions that I might've wanted to hear from the back of the room when they were on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also they, not that um you are, the audiences are great. Again, I keep going back to that, but you're, you know how to, play the game. It's your game. You're doing, you're putting them in the best possible light where sometimes you hear the suggestions. People have the, like, uh, Kid Rock trans, like they're throwing out, which by the way, for a guy like Mark Norman might work incredibly well, yeah. but if you're not that type of comic where your brain goes to that, it may not, but they, they want to, not that they're trying, they're trying to be supportive at all times, but it's like, oh, or people dying on a submarine and you're like, that, that not that maybe not where their brain goes to. So yeah. it's cool that you're able to, no matter what happened before, there's also a second act to them. That if sure. that um, and again everything goes well, but but there's something a, a different flavor now, and you give a level of comfortability because you're sort of the intermediary of the audience and the and the comedian. Yeah, I'll be the good stage. guy. I'll be the good guy or the bad guy, dependent on what they need me for. Yeah, it's great. It's it, like the the Batman quote. <laughs> it's like. You, He's you not this, not who he, the city deserves or what they need or yeah, whatever. That's what yeah, he yeah. needs right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> Mash the wine. I thought your I thought your quote was going to be just vengeance. Um, well, that was what I was going to ask you. So you, um, I first heard about you because when I got on the scene, I was doing exclusively impressions, and somebody I don't know who it was, but somebody was like, "Have you ever heard?" of Jeremiah Watkins. And I went on a show with you, I think we were together on a show at the Improv, and this was very early on in my career. Mm -hmm. And you, they were like, you like this guy's stuff. You know, you were doing impressions, doing a lot of mixed stuff. You do such a great Kings of Leon impression. People should check that out. But um, is there like, what's like, is there an impression that you do that you've just never been able to work on stage because it's either so obscure or it's just people are like, it sounds like him or it's funny, but like for whatever reason, it just doesn't. Um, I have to shelf certain impressions until people, uh, until they get popular enough for the audiences to know who they are. I feel the same way. Uh, sometimes I'm a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, it's so interesting. Some of the, the some of the impressions I was doing years ago that I would put like on reels or different stuff like that. Like I see on TikTok all the time now and it's so mm -hmm. weird. I'm like, oh, I guess they're just now popular enough. Like I used, I was doing a Patrick Warburton so early on where people were in audiences were really like, I have no idea who that is. Yeah. And then you're doing the thing like, you know, it's uh buddy from Seinfeld, you know, come on. A little bit like like you're trying to explain you're leading them. them. Yeah, you like pull well, up his you've reel. Never heard of me? I'm on Family Guy. Okay. Yeah, that is Nothing. what happens a lot of times. You're just reading the, the yeah, resume. Yeah. yeah. Really? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. I love perfect. It. It's perfect. You, you, I mean, you sound just like it, but the fact that that's what you have to say his name. Oh no, no, it's all. That's always the worst sign. If you have to say the impression, <laughs> dude, the, I always feel that way. Yeah, yeah. like I'm, <laughs> you know, yeah. so and so. Like you're like, oh, you're you're already out. You're already dude, out. well, yeah. it's so funny because um, I did that with Seth Rogen. I learned him like probably like 16, 17 years ago. Yeah, and I remember. I was like, oh man, I think this is good, but it's just not resonating with anybody. And then I went to do stand up in Toronto 
And I was like, oh, or let me just try to do Seth Rogen. And I remember it like murdering up there. And then I like was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I came back and it died. Right. And then he did um, the uh, uh, the one with uh, with James Franco about North Korea. Um, oh, the dictator. No, no, that's the um, Sash Baron Cohen one. No, no, yeah, where they where they go to kill Kim Jong Un. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, it's oh. I can't remember what it's called. But but um, the, yeah, interview. the interview. Gotcha. But um, yeah. but that when 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 I did it then then you're right. It was like people knew who he was because all the news outlets picked it up, and then so I could do it. Right. Because but it's totally true. I think there's a lot of is, singing impressions and stuff like that too. Like where I'll I'll learn um like a music impression. Yeah. For it's a, but then then sometimes they're a one hit wonder and then other times they go on to to make more things. But the good thing about one hit wonders are if you were to do. Um, like aha or whatever take on me like right. people I mean those one hit wonders the the staying power of a one hit wonder true is unbelievable that yeah. if you you know if you were to do much like more um, than the artist well that's the thing yeah I mean the hit or the hit is there's as much Trinidad James met him one time humble brag and, um, he did gold all my chains gold all of my rank and I remember like hearing that song <laughs> and, and then somebody the other day like online or whatever was just like is this guy like one of the goats of all time and then everyone's like he only had that one hit and he's like and then somebody commented yeah but we're still talking about yeah. it and it's like yeah I mean and that's what's cool I always think about singing impressions more people know music they may not know who the like if you give the, the lead singer's name or whatever but they know the song yeah. yeah, and so if you do something because you do uh, Blink One Eighty Two, did I see you do that at the Comedy Magic Club? Uh, yeah, 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 it was great, yeah. and everybody liked it. Oh and, yeah, it's that's that's one of those where they've been maybe. around long enough, and they're back now. They're very in the news, especially like mm-hmm. since the 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 douchebag son of the billionaire of the submarine went to a, a Blink One Eighty Two concert. Their name keeps being passed around there at Coachella, so I'm like, so oh, what we're trying to say is, awesome. thank you, Submarine. <laughs> yeah. Is what Jeremiah thank is saying. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, PlayStation. Hey, did mm-hmm. you hear that? Uh, by the way, Netflix is getting like a ton of shit because they were like scheduled to release Titanic like this week, right after it happened. But they were doing were... it because it was just in the theaters. Right, right, right. Like they're like they're just doing it, and then but of That's course because of sad, people are like really you're you're not going to postpone it at all. Disney just released Yellow Submarine. Right, had to pull it immediately. <laughs> yeah, the hunt for. Red October's back out streaming. See you later. Get out of there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Leviathan. It's an old horror movie then. <laughs> um, Ghost but, ship. Yeah. It's only, I mean, yeah. That's the thing. It's like, what are you going to. Yeah. Th- listen, Netflix, bring it back on. We all want to see Titanic. I don't think, yeah. in my head though, that's so funny that that's where we're at. We're like, how dare you? People <laughs> just died. How dare you put up a movie? Yeah, that, yeah. That, that came out that was a global hit. Was it just in the theaters? I don't care. I don't know. How long do you need to wait? <laughs> yeah. What is the wait time to to uh, unleash something based on, on tragedies in the news? I mean, g- give it a month. Yeah, give it a month. It'll be back. <laughs> um, I can't wait to watch it on Netflix. Um, we never digitally did. remastered? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like the, the, the extra scene at the end. <laughs> The extra scene, at the end, where they do off of the new, the, the, the submarine. <laughs> oh man! There's not. Wait, there was an after credit sequence. Wait a second, uh. huh? <laughs> it's yeah. the old lady with an eye patch. She's like Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> she was yeah. down there. They CGI Bill Paxton yeah, to be yeah. like one more journey. <laughs> Dude, that's what's so. I mean, listen, I, 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 I don't. I think they got a lot of shit, but I, th- I think it's still coming out. Do you think they'll ever recast and do another Titanic? No. I mean... I mean, there are millions of reasons why they would. Timothy Chalamet? But... <laughs> as Billy Zane? Curveball! Oh, Curveball, it would be a, it would be a, It would be a lesbian relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, it would uh, be him and Army Hammer. It'd be a gay relationship. Yeah, no, Army yeah. Hammer would be there. Yeah, he, he goes, I'm here for the buffet. Yeah, yeah. He, what do we have tonight? The chef. Lady fingers. The yeah, flop. He, dude, Army Hammer should be uh, should be uh, a Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter. Lecter. Girl, we on the same wavelength right now. That would be a, that would be so good. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think what, yeah. If they redid, by the way, I think they totally could do a reboot of Titanic. Well, Probably. I, I don't know, man, because I think the original is is iconic because of in in a large part because of the cast. And because of the special effects, like I don't think maybe enough time has passed yet that the special effects would suddenly be so much better. I mean, they're doing it with Spider Man. Yeah, I know. There's but a seventeen Titanic. Did you like the right. second Spider Man? 
Which one? Oh, the, the you'll animated. Have to be more specific. The animated. Oh, yeah. We did. We talked about it. Yeah. Um, on Do you here. think it's as good as the first? Uh, no, I said I like the first one better. I okay. think it's better. Thank you. Nah, I think it's better. You, what did you like about the first better? They're ju- they're trying to rep. It happens in sequels all the time uh-huh. where they're they're trying to amplify what worked in the original mm-hmm. to the tenth degree. Yeah, yeah. And they forced so much stuff in. Mm-hmm. And I know that the next movie is coming out in like ten months or whatever. It's but not. I've never seen them just give up on closure of a movie. It uh-huh. really like was upsetting to me. I was like, what? That yeah, really? it really is a two parter. It really was like the sequel part one and then and well, then, then the next one. That's is fine. Sequel Maybe part two. Bill right. it is that, but dude, yeah. I don't know. I don't I, I think that they and also not only did they try to exponentially make it bigger the way that like there's more kills in a second Friday the thirteenth or whatever. Mm. Dude, there's did, like hundred and fifty Spider Man's well, in that I said one it, scene. They yeah. did it with to the power of ten. So there were, you know what I mean? Like it's so not only do they amplify one, but everything got amplified. But don't you think that, but don't you think that artistically it was, it was to the next level uh, from the first one with the way that they like incorporated the different styles of animation and the, I do and the think music, that artistically the way they that were, it was shot. They were able I know to shot, evolve. But, I did. Yeah. I told you this right after though. I thought I liked the soundtrack in the first one better. Uh-huh. I, I do okay. that. So yeah. I do think that the idea there were certain. I mean, listen, I thought it was an incredible movie, and there's definitely aspects about it that I loved. Mm-hmm. But for me, I just thought the first one was was superior. I still loved it, but yeah. that's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you know, this third one, they they had a hundred animators that a, a new story just broke that that left that walked out on this last one because they said that the working conditions were so bad. And one guy was like, "Oh, do you think that the third one will come out in March?" He's like, "Not a chance in hell." Because it was just, it was, and you can imagine it's sensory overload, yeah. dude. I so I took my two year old son to that. <laughs> he had he been to a movie yet? He had seen the Super Mario Bros. movie, okay. and he sat like had he this done acid yet the whole time. <laughs> yeah, dude, he loved that movie. Eating popcorn, not even he sat the whole time. Wow. Watched it. Wow. Now the Spider Man movie. I had to go on some walks with him because it was sensory over. My wife got him. she it got sick from it. Like she, dude, it was. It yeah. was like, she's if very you're sensitive to that kind like, of thing. Yeah. Um, there's no, ch- you stand no chance. That's at all. what we talked about. That's the thing. It's, it's so I do. It's tough because right. It's like everything is a bunch of fish hooks. When you try to make things better or bigger or evolve, there are things that will lack because you will mm-hmm. have taken and grown too much in certain areas. Right. You're trying to replicate anything, and it's hard to know what is the right stuff to replicate and what stuff needs to be pared back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the idea with the third one is, I, I mean, I again, like what, to your point, a mm-hmm. conclusion, you know, it'll be the end, but then right before you leave, it'll be question mark. Yeah. And then, well, yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll be front, front and center, but sensory overload, I can only imagine for a child. Yeah, he got scared at points. He even said, I want to go home. I was, and I'm a, a giant Spider-Man fan. I'm like, let's go on a walk. And then, uh, and then we'll come back in here. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to leave the movie entirely. We're on the verge yeah. right now of trying to figure out what his first movie is going to be. Cause, Dude, uh, Super Mario Bros. Surprisingly, it doesn't get scary yeah, in parts. Yeah, and man, it was that might really be good for him. enjoyable. Even Bowser, like the way Jack Black did it, incredible, so amazing, funny. so funny. What Peach, if, Peach just hit the the charts. You do you do a great Jack Black. Dude, <laughs> totally. Peaches, 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 peaches. I love you. <laughs> do you do that on stage? No, no. Because you play piano. You're very good. I'm all right. I'm all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey. I, I don't do Don't pian- play this guy in pool. I don't I don't do piano uh very often on stage. At the improv, since it's there, yeah. I'll sometimes like riff with the crowd and improvise some songs. Yeah. Uh, like at the end of my set, but it's never like I never will bring a piano with me. For like, sure. You you know, to do the hour, but I'm like, oh, is there a piano over here? Then- but a lot of the improvs do have pianos. Yeah. Yeah. Which is so nice. But and I think it's so fun. Because you, you're you a great singer and, and, and you do um, straight jokes that they're not expecting it. That's my goal with the impressions is what's the reason why you're doing the impression? And are you doing the impression just to flex the voice or do you have punchlines with it? Totally. I tried to do a Charlie Day the other day on stage and I have just been running through a bunch of jokes mm-hmm. with it just to find it. Because, again, it's one of those that I did for a long time. I know that people are diehard Always Sunny uh, fans, but yeah. there's a lot of people that have never seen that show, and I think that it's introducing him to a new generation of people. Obviously, he's a movie star and very successful in his own right, mm-hmm. but Super Mario Brothers has sort of catapulted him. Oh, yeah. He's playing normal, 
in the Garfield movie that's coming out. Oh, really? And Chris Pratt is playing Garfield. <laughs> True story. Hey, Garfield. How are you gonna How are you gonna top Bill Murray as Garfield? That's oh, yeah. perfect I mean, casting. Yeah, and the that guy, is perfect. But casting. the guy who did him in the cartoon also did Peter Vankman in Slimer and the Real Ghostbusters, the cartoon. What? He is such a yeah. Oh, it's the same guy. Man. So it's wow. like they have such a similar energy. And here's the thing. <laughs> I, I love Chris Pratt. I love Chris Pratt. I want to work with you someday, Chris. Yeah. James Gunn, <laughs> you too. I'm just going to start listing people. They'll yeah. come up on the screen. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the Vision Board Podcast. <laughs> Dude, please. But I think that he is so... Uh, we loved both of the Spider-Man animated Into <laughs> yeah. the Spider-Verse. Uh, Jeremiah said he yeah. hated the second yeah. one. No, 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 no. Uh, I was sitting here defending him. No, 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 we no, just no, no. cut that part. <laughs> Um, but I think that he's so positive, whereas Garfield is the opposite. Mm-hmm. Like the idea that this guy is like a, you know, that's Dude, why he was perfect you know, for Mario. You know who'd be great? Stephen Wright as Garfield. Yeah. Whoa. Wouldn't that be an amazing yeah. Garfield? Amazing. Ooh. Yeah. I, I mean, I think you, uh, you lose half the audience. Yeah, you do. But I think, you know. He, he has existential crisis every single day. <laughs> I would love to see that. He did, he's bald, but he has this long yeah, yeah, yeah. orange yeah. hair. Yeah, yeah, he's like a, he yeah. says beanie all, all right. the time. Yeah, it's a good beer. There's a name Monday. Yeah, dude, that would be, I mean, in normal, yeah, Charlie Day is normal, and then John Cena is Odie. Interesting. If, you re- if you're remembering, Odie did not talk. So I don't know if that's just going to be John Cena's doing inner monologues or whatever. He just comes. Yeah, that's. I mean, I don't know. Um, you have a you have a stand up special right now, on yeah. y- YouTube. Yeah, and it's doing quite well. Oh, thanks, dude. Thank and you. you have a new special that was a crowd work special. Yeah, that I do just these, dropped like two uh, weeks ago. Yeah, I do these. Um, uh, this is the third one I've done. It's a uh, I call them crowd work documentaries. Yeah, and they're kind of mockumentaries on. Uh, just different genres of of docs, but in the in the vein and in the lens of a stand up. Uh, so, I'll do a city, and if something strange happened, like the first one that I did was is called the Weirdest Man Alive, and it's kind of like a sci fi mockumentary kind of thing. I had this slot for this festival that I was doing in St. Louis, Missouri, and there was a guy that was so weird that I was like, oh. I'm talking to this guy the rest of the time yeah. because he was so out of his mind and so bizarre. Everything he said, everything he would say to me was such a curveball that would hit me where I'm like, oh, I've got to come up with a riff for this. Okay, this is insane. Yeah. So I did that. And then I did the second one that I did is called The Woman with No Gender. She was not like, like she was saying that she. She was very saying, like, she's like, well, how do you know that I don't identify as this? But she, like, definitely was just a lady that was just being difficult in the crowd. <laughs> I, like, I respect people and their Wait, pronouns can you believe and that? stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> Give our, our listeners time to pause to see if they can believe what you just said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then this third one that I did uh, is uh, called The Last Riff. And it's... Uh, uh, in the style of the last dance, uh, if you're a fan yeah, of the Michael dude. Jordan and Bulls uh, Huge. E- e- ESPN series, and it's me like as an athlete approaching stand up. Oh, that's great! Yeah, uh, Blake Griffin style. So I'm inter- I'm getting interviewed about my stand up and like what was happening that night, and I'm I'm always interviewing myself. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, like we were talking, you know, when you first got here, it's just like content, like what, because you never know what's going to hit. Sure. That's yeah. a crazy thing. Like, obviously, put your stuff out there as much as you possibly because that's that's what I love about you is you have so much. I mean, you have two podcasts, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, I just became a man, mm-hmm. and you, mm-hmm. and you hit puberty. I just hit puberty. And Jeremiah awesome Wonders, uh-huh. which I just did. Yeah, and dude, so fun. And it was it was awesome. And then Scissor Bros. Yeah. And so I mean, that's the thing. Like you, that's what I always admired about you. That you there was like a an engine that was always going. It, like, you know, I'd seen you and I'd done a lot of stand up with you, but to go online, like, you've amassed a pretty hefty collection of clips and adventures and, 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 uh, and sort of projects online. Yeah. The goal definitely, I would love to. I mean, and it's crazy to me that it hasn't happened, that somebody hasn't seen the vision for this yet, but I would love to assemble like an Avengers team of comics to create like our own sketch show. There's so many good comics that are would be down to do it yeah it just needs the proper funding like to make happen but there's so much talent of 
of LA and New York comics that are just like they'd just be down to do it. Totally. And it would be so good and with no like restrictions online and stuff like that, it could be it could end up being, you know, one of the biggest things ever. But like uh, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. It's that's, tough. that's a it's a very tough Nut to crack. Yeah, when I was talking to Kyle Donegan about it, um, because he's he's yeah, he's one of the I mean, he's one of the best sketch guys out. And he I go, How what's going on with you? He goes, editing all the time. He goes, That's all I do is edit. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that ended up being half the job on the sketch show that we produced. Yeah, so we put together a sketch show Mm -hmm. um, you know, forty years ago Mm -hmm. and it was I thought it was I think that the 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 material was great and I think that the um I think that we had a lot of uh, uh, good things going for it, but we yeah. just didn't know enough about the behind the scenes right, and the actual producing, producing editing, right yeah. of it. And I think that that really got us mired because there wa- you couldn't shoot stuff on a phone. There wasn't, I mean, there was YouTube, but just barely. It was yeah. like like 2008 maybe or 2009. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like if YouTube was three, four years old. The, the capabilities didn't exist. And that was one of the hardest things because it was exhausting to sort of have to learn all that stuff in real time. But mm-hmm. we put together a real crew, spent our own money, and it was a two-person sketch show, a la Mr. Show, a la Key and Peel, that type of stuff. And I thought there was a lot of good that came out of it. Mm-hmm. It was just incredibly, it was frustrating that it didn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Well, but also I think but the, the final product that we had was, I, th- I think we were simultaneously, it was a final product that we were proud to have done considering we didn't really know what we were doing, but also that now that we did feel like we knew so much more because of that process, that if we were to do it again, it would be so much better. Yeah. That we're like, gosh, I, at this point, I don't feel like that this product actually represents what we could do now right. that we know what we that, know. That, was, that yeah. sounds like the yeah. review that we got. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll they, bet you, it was. I'll bet you guys learned a lot through yeah, this process. That's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, this is something you guys were probably so, thought you'd be prouder of. Congrats on the moral victory. Yeah, um, I, the, you it, you made a thing. You did yeah. something. <laughs> that's what we should have called it. John and Seth make a thing. Make uh-huh. a thing. <laughs> um, but you know, it's fun, and we obviously we we. I mean, we're best friends, and we we had a great time hanging. Which again is what I think is the the glory about I mean, you could tell your friends when you do stand up on the spot or when you do you have guests on excuse me like that's what it is it's about a singular sport that we do in stand up and mm-hmm. how to make it as collaborative as possible yeah. because with the internet and you know far better smarter minds have said this than than I there is less competition amongst each other because there's mm-hmm. space for everybody. It's oh, not dude, totally. trying to get like that that one spot at the Tonight Show and then anybody else who's in that in in the same vein or covers that tracks. They're now are it's not available for them. Yeah, and so that's I mean that's fantastic. Now, I uh, I think about it, I talk often about the worst gigs that I had because I came to this secondary right. I started as an actor, and then I about 10 years into my acting career, I started doing stand-up about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I talk about, I've had many uh, that could be labeled the worst gigs. Is there one that stands out in your mind that is just one of the most, where you were like, you know what, I met, this might be the day I quit comedy. Or like... Hmm. Are there 50 that are tied for first? (laughs) There's a, I mean, there's a handful... How much time do we have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a handful. This this ended up being... uh, and okay, this ended up working out, but this was just the, uh, this year. Uh, I was performing on New Year's, and uh, the power went out. Um, and in between shows, uh, they were like, well, we might just shine a flashlight on you and, and do the show. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, no mic or anything? Jeremiah Watkins brings in the new year with campfire Dude, stories. I know. Like, I was like, what? Luckily, the power came on just right before in time. Oh, but, then, like, I've had, like, a lot of close calls uh, with that on the road. Um, How would they give you the light if they're already giving it to you? <laughs> hey. They just play closing time. Like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Uh, there was this one, uh, even though it was a horrible gig, it's one of my favorites. Uh and there's some comics who know this gig back in the day. It was a sushi place in Morro Bay called Osaka Joe's. And um, you di- it didn't pay in money. It just paid in stage time and sushi. Proud sponsor of the podcast. <laughs> and you slept in the back of the restaurant for the gig. You slept <laughs> in the back of the restaurant? There was the restaurant, and then there was like slight, like a like it was like an office slash room in the back that you ended up sleeping in overnight because it was a two-night gig. And you weren't allowed to wear boxers to bed. It was really strange. Wow. <laughs> it was it was a weird one. It was a weird one. Wow. Yeah. And, but That's unlimited funny. sushi for dinner, but no pay. 
but they put your name in the newspaper. This is when the newspaper is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> real weird dude real weird stuff you just, the guy the you guy try to buy as many of those as possible and mail oh, them oh dude i had i dude, think i still have frame one. it the, the guy was randomly showing us his gun and stuff like in the back i was like this is a weird gig is man. this guy also on the show no, <laughs> no he's just no, the no. owner he just loves comics. security <laughs> yeah 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 he would, he would heckle the owner would heckle the comics i've been on shows like that that the booker wow. of the show has heckled and i'm like what, what are you doing man Oh, dude, I, like I, I had a, a gig He's where like, this helping. happened uh, in the Midwest where just this table was awful. And I kept like kind of looking at security like, you know, when you exhaust your riff resources where you're like, this isn't this is becoming not funny for the rest of the crowd because it's just distracting. At this totally. Point. And I keep looking at them. And then after show, they're like, sorry, that was um, that was one of the investors of the club. Uh, so we couldn't say anything to them. I was like, <laughs> What the fr- what? Well, that's the worst when it happens in a corporate gig. Yeah. When I was yeah. I went to do a corporate gig up in Monterey Bay. Yeah. And um they and they were like, if they heckle you, you're not allowed to respond. That's so dumb. And I was just like, so for that moment I'm deaf? Yeah. Because yep. then they kept trying to get me to talk to them, and I literally had to be like, I'm not allowed to talk to you. And they hadn't paid me yet. And so it was one of those <laughs> things where I was like, Dude, it's sushi. It's the weirdest. Yeah, yeah. They were all. It was the NRA. They were just cleaning guns. <laughs> but it was just crazy because you. They don't know the, the the talk that I've had with some fucking intern or whatever who's like giving me a list. Where I'm yeah. like, these people just want to have a good time. Mm-hmm. Like, did somebody just be like, just start yelling the N word at the last gig, and now yeah. you're like, no talking, none at all. Everyone yeah. stop. Yeah. It was just such and a like weird... ever since we had Michael Richards last year, we can't do this again. So yeah, <laughs> we have to have rules. Exactly. Don't make eye contact with them. Don't was... feed them after midnight. It was weird. It was just yeah. So that's yeah. Those are pretty. What's that place called? O- Osaka Joe's. Joe's. Osaka Joe's. Yeah. I don't know if it's still open, but if it is, go say it was up to Joe. <laughs> have him show you his gun. <laughs> but don't make eye contact. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, I, I do have to say, though, I think that if a gig did pay an unlimited sushi, that would kind of be our dream. Well, if dude, we, early, if we on, get paid in early on in, stu- yeah. in stand-up, I was like, this yeah. is awesome. Like, we didn't care at all. And they're like, they're putting us up, too? It didn't matter if it was in the back of the restaurant. Oh, dude, yeah, That yeah. sounds like the beginning of a, of a sequel to Hostel. Like, Hostel 5. Well, that's what I was comics. thinking about. Yeah. I, I was like, w- were they like, it says like a sex trade or something, or human trafficking was going on back there. Oh, he's just an odd guy. Yeah. Sleep with a blindfold on. You right. saw nothing. Right. If you need sushi, just ring the bell. <laughs> he doesn't we'll slide your, it under the door. He doesn't shake your hand. He just, like, greets you like this. Like, yes, my pretty little comic. With Yellowtail. <laughs> <laughs> what the? Oh, all right. uh, uh, where can people find you? You can find me if you are interested at jeremiahwatkins.com for tour dates, uh, which I'll be in Brea, California on July 7th, Huntington Beach, California on July 8th, and then I got a bunch of dates on the road coming up Fort Worth, Dallas, Winnipeg, uh, Kansas City, a bunch of dates there. Uh, Jeremiah Stand Up on all social media and youtube.com slash Jeremiah. Just type in Jeremiah Watkins on YouTube. Uh, there's Stand Up on the Spot, there's all the podcasts that like Jonathan mentioned. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, I will be at Tempe Improv, like I said before. This weekend, it comes out Thursday. I will be there th- th- this night, uh, June 29th through July 2nd. Come out. We got tons of shows. Um, don't know how that, that, that's going to go with the 4th of July competing with America's birthday. Uh, we shall see. Yeah. Um, Good luck, but, buddy. Uh, any Anything? No, uh, just go to my, uh, go to at the Seth Shapiro on Instagram and I'll, and I post about my gigs there. Great. Uh, For Jonathan Kite, Seth Shapiro, Ben, Jeremiah Watkins, this has been Kite Club Podcast. Thanks so much. See you next time.